Hello everybody, it's the Alco Diesel Guy with another project for you. And you probably recognize this engine from my RS11 sort of review slash documentary I did on the Atlas RS11 back back a while ago. The long and short of this locomotive is that I was always that I've always been sort of desperately trying to find an Atlas RS11 in Conrail paint in classic form, and I just haven't been able to find one for a reasonable price. I finally bought the shell and thought I would do a project where I built the Atlas classic chassis from scratch. Unfortunately, this hit a big wall when I found I couldn't actually get the chassis by itself and some key parts. Then I happened to be up in the Finger Lakes on my yearly trip with my folks, stopped in Lake City's Hobbies. They had an RS11 on the shelf there for a pretty good price and got a decent deal on it went ahead and uh, bought that engine and slipped this body onto that chassis and used it in the RS11 review I did. Now, while many of you noticed it did run pretty smooth, it was kind of rough, and that's probably down to bad lubricant. So what I plan to do now is to set this into a full-on locomotive DCC and sound equipped, but first I've got to go ahead and do something about the lubricant. So we'll start by placing this upside down in this foam cradle thing and using a Phillips head screwdriver to remove the two screws, which will in turn allow me to get access into the locomotive itself and expose all the gears so I can go ahead and clean them in some alcohol and get this thing to run correctly before I go ahead and install the DCC system into it, DCC kit into it. Again, once both couplers are removed, you can just simply grasp the frame up from the chassis and pull them apart. And as we see underneath the hood, as for those of you who haven't seen that video, I recommend checking it out. This is actually an earlier production RS11, it, and this is dictated by a few different things. To start with, it has the 8-pin plug, not the 21-pinner. It also has, in this case, the aging incandescent bulbs on either side. These cannot be used with the DCC system I'm going to be using because I'm going to use a TCS setup, so they're going to have to go, and that board will also have to go. Anyway, let's go ahead and get the shot out of the way and take a closer look. The next step, once I've gotten everything situated, is to go ahead and remove the four screws. The weights are again secured down to the actual chassis itself using four Phillips head screws, long style screws. To remove them, we simply utilize a Phillips head screwdriver. And once all four of the screws are removed, again two per weight, we can go ahead and pull both of those weights off. As you see, I've already taken one off right there to expose the worm gear cover housings. With the worm gear covers slash housings exposed, the next step is to use a flathead screwdriver and gently pop the worm gear covers themselves off to expose the worm gears. And taking a look at this one right over here off the front truck, I believe that is, we see that it is very sticky. In fact, it was hard to get out. As you see, the stick, the grease is so sticky, I, it actually, instead of making my fingers slip back and forth, is actually causing them to stick together, which is a bad sign. The sticky grease will essentially put stress on the motor and can eventually burn it out or cause problems with the gears. It's just bad stuff to have in there. So what we're going to do now is simply disassemble all those parts and toss them in that little bin you see me putting there. This is something I got when I ordered soup soup from Go Out. Anyway, any kind of plastic bowl will actually do. Just please note that you're, probably, you're not going to use that ever again for food, so be forewarned you're going to retire it to a servitude of, well, serving your locomotives, not your food for lack of a better term. And who next stop is to pop the other worm gear cover off, disassemble it, and again throw it inside the little plastic dish there. I'm going to put alcohol in this in a little bit to clean it up. Next we need to remove the stock circuit board. The 8-pin decoder is not going to do it for me, especially since those decoders are becoming a little harder to come by in general. Uh, anyway, my modern TCS system with its Keep Alive board needs to go in place, so this needs to come out. The headlights can actually stay connected as I'm not going to be reusing them as, again, the board is designed with resistors on board for LED lights, and I happen to have one from another project I can slip right in here, so really make this a first-class project, so that's what I'm going to do. Again, same usual procedure, nothing new here. You have to remove four tabs to get the board itself free, plus two additional wire tabs that hold the actual motor control wires in place in the middle there. Then you simply bend the main clips that hold the board in place out, and you can simply pull the board and set, a, set it aside. With the board now clear of the chassis, we can now simply lift up on the chassis itself, and doing so will actually cause the trucks to drop out as long as the worm gears have been, and shafts have been successfully removed. We can now tackle the trucks themselves, which again have this nasty grease on it. They need to be disassembled. Again, the usual procedure. To get the side frames off, we have to actually have to take the bottom plate of these trucks off. 
To do this, we'll use a plastic sponger to push the tabs and clips back so we can drop the base plate off. This will in turn again release the side frames, allowing them to be released properly. Please note, I've been able to get away with doing with not doing this in the past, but I wouldn't recommend it as I have broken some tabs most recently, and once these tabs are broken, you will need to replace the side frames, so it's a good idea to do it this way. Remove the base plate and then remove the side frames as you see me doing there. Again, the base plate goes into the vat right there, which will soon be filled with alcohol. The side frames get the same treatment. Again, they have some grease on them. They usually do. I prefer to just clean them to make sure. With the side frames and base off, the wheels can simply be pulled right out of their place. As you can see, there's a lot of this nasty grease in there. Next, we have to further take the gear place of the truck apart itself. We use, again, a Phillips head screwdriver to remove the two screws, one on the front and one on the back. And this will allow the whole assembly to simply fall apart. With the second screw out, we can simply separate the two pieces of the gear case and expose the gears themselves. Simple drive system with three gears. All three of these have to go back in the same way, although it's pretty easy to figure it out if you make a mistake. Uh, just make sure that they roll smoothly. If they start to hesitate, then you know you got them backwards. Just mess with the order. But anyway, that is the order in case you're interested. Again, all three of these gears go into the vat to be cleaned, and the gear case... The reason they're all being separated is to ensure that everything gets a clean shot of alcohol and will therefore be removed of the grease as much as possible. Any residue I can then clean out with a small toothbrush or a microbrush later on. We again repeat the same procedure with the other truck. All pieces are separated and again put in the vat to be degreased. This grease again has to be completely removed. And that leads us down to these other parts. We again now have the wheel sets as we see here, the truck sides, and the wheel pickup shoes as well as the wheel sets themselves. I think we'll throw the wheel sets in the vat this time to make sure that they're cleaned off as that grease seems to have really done a number on them. As for the pickup shoes and the sides, well, the sides don't seem to be too bad, but I think I'll put them in there anyway. The pickup shoes, I find, actually, it's better off to just go ahead and clean them with alcohol outside of the vat because if you stick them in there, they're more likely going to do more It's more likely to do more harm than good as they'll then absorb the grease from the other parts a lot of times as this stuff is going to, as the alcohol tends to move the grease around. Please note I have the thrush washer separated from the worm gear bearings. If I didn't show it before, make sure you do that so you get a good shot of alcohol on it. And that's what I'm going to be using. The 97% isopropyl alcohol, isopropyl or whatever you pronounce it. I'm going to go ahead now and fill this vat to the point where all of the parts are submerged in it. Not very much to this. Pop it open and just simply squirt it in there. Again, once all the parts are noticeably submerged in the alcohol, just slightly above, I want to say, you should have the level of alcohol just above the highest part. You can then go ahead and basically put it to the side for the time being. In my case, I usually hang on to the covers for these little vat things, uh, soup bowl things, as they come, as this will seal it and prevent the stuff from flowing out if I accidentally knock it over. I don't recommend doing that, but just in case you do, it's one less thing you have to worry about spilling. So let's go ahead and put the cover on there and put it to the side, and we'll pick this up now in about, say... 52 hours or so. With the utilization of a paper towel and a micro brush, we're now going to go ahead and do a fine clean job on these parts. Again, they've been soaking for roughly 52 hours, 64 hours I think it was in the end. Anyway, we're going to now just simply take them initially and put them out right on the paper towel, let them dry off a bit. Now, they may not look too drastically different from where they, from the way they were before we put them in the vat, but as we'll see with the condition of the alcohol water in that vat now, uh, much has happened. Again, the next step is, as we see the terrible condition of that alcohol water, is to use the, what's left of it to help knock off the residue or anything, anything residual from the grease on the gear case covers, which is where the grease loves to pile up, especially where the worm gear housing mounts, the worm gear cover mounts, those little snap tabs there tend to get it. Uh, the splines for the gears tend to get full of grease. They need to be cleaned off. So I'll go do that. And also, the base cover also tends to have a little of that grease pile up on it. Again, it's sitting at the base of the locomotive. All the oil and grease tend to make their way down there at one point. That stuff has to get cleaned as it's old. This is, again, an engine that's now uh, 10, probably closer to 20 plus years old, considering it is one of the earlier models. Again, I'm not sure exactly when it was purchased by the previous owner. This is, I believe, on like assignment shelf, so I'm not sure of the exact age. Anywho, same procedure. Go in there with a brush and submerge it and whack it back and forth with a small toothbrush or a micro brush if you have one. Get rid of every last bit of the grease on there. You want to get as much of this off as possible just to make it look better and to reduce the reoccurrence of a problem with the drivetrain getting to be slower, to hesitate because of this grease and further risking burning out a motor. 
Now this is admittedly a more tedious part of this project, but I guarantee you the more effort you put in now, the more results you will get later on. A much more reliable locomotive, less troublesome. It really is worth to take your time worth it to take your time here and get it done right. Now we'll do a little bit more fine tuning as I call it on this, get a little bit more of the grease residue out there. It seems like no matter how much you clean these things, there's always a little bit of wad of grease, and I really that's a pet peeve of me. My thing is if I'm gonna tear this apart and do the job, I wanna do it right. I certainly don't want to tear this apart and do it all over again. <laughs> as that probably would cause me a lot of mental agita. So anyway, yeah, I'm going to just go through here and rub everything down, get every last inch, inch of grease I can find out of this, every last ounce, every last speck of grease off this thing to the best of my abilities, make it look as much like a new locomotive that has never been worked on before. And once we're done with that, we can start reassembling the whole model. Let's start with the trucks, and we'll again grab one of the gears and grab my Labelle 107 oil. I'm just going to put a little of this on the spline of the gear itself, which sits in the hole. In this case, the splines are, in fact, on the gears themselves, and there's a hole that matches up on the side frame itself. Simply slip the gear into the hole itself, aligning it correctly. Again, the bigger gear goes on the top. The sort of mid-gear goes in the middle. If it, doesn't go, if it doesn't move right, you've got the order backwards. Just simply mess around with it. And again, place a little oil on the opposite sides of the gear now where you put the opposite case on. Again, the case that you're going to be placing the gears the gears into for assembly is going to be the one where the gear worm gear housing is actually a part of. Not a big deal, just go ahead and make sure you find that part and then place the gears down like I just showed you. Then grab the two screws that came with the assembly and simply place them back in the holes. Tighten them down to hold the gear case together before you go any further, because if you don't, well, the whole assembly can fall apart and that will make you quite miserable, to put it mildly. <laughs> And whoops, it looks like I got the assembly of the gears wrong here, so let me go ahead and actually swap them out. It looks like I put a big gear, an extra big gear in there. Again, don't worry too much about getting this order wrong. You can always take it back apart and sort of learn from your mistakes. I went ahead and found the proper gear and inserted it right in place right there. And after a little attempts, after a few attempts to make sure it spun correctly, I found it was working the way it was supposed to. And I went ahead and completed the assembly on it. With the truck assembly together, we simply put a few small dots on each of the gear. Again, gears, again, very small. Those are actually kind of big there. I was a little annoyed at myself if I remember correctly on this one. But I prefer to put a few small dots. You can also just simply cover the worm gear with the grease and let it spread around. But I like to make sure, especially after they've just been bathed in alcohol, that everything is no longer dry because you never know exactly how it's going to run afterward. You don't want the gears to be bone dry as they can start to chip or run rough or wear excessively. Anyway, we're going to go ahead now and repeat the same procedure to get the other truck assembled, and then we'll move on to the next phase, which is installing the wheels. Now, to install our wheels, we're going to use what's called conductive lubricant, a.k.a. conductive cleaner. This one is by Bachmann. It's one of their Easy Lube brands. I'm going to go ahead and just fill the cap with just a teeny bit of that, and with, again, a new micro brush. Again, not the same one I used to clean the engine off. You don't want to do that because we don't want the grease to inhibit. Again, here's a close-up of that bottle. Uh, we're going to go ahead and, with a fresh micro brush now, take some of that lubricant, put it on the tip of the brush, and just go over all the wheel sets themselves to ensure that they are in properly lubed condition. Again, conductive lubricant does two things. It lubricates the shoe connection because, again, this wire, these wheels probably me drag along the shoes themselves, and if the shoes are not lubricated and the and or the wheel splines are not lubricated, what will happen is it will literally wear the actual pickup shoe out, and that'll give you a big problem because then the pickup shoe will not be tight enough around the axles of the pickup bearings to actually pick up the power consistently, and you'll have erratic performance. So you want to make sure you do this. Best of all, conductive loop, unlike regular oil, which is why you don't want to use it, actually enhances conductivity at the same time lubricating. So, yeah, it's really the really the only kind of substance I would recommend to lubricate these particular connections. Again, there you see me doing it. Just grab the brush and just give each one a gentle little stroke of it. You can also go over the wheels if you find that they're still not quite clean from the alcohol bath. I recommend doing all that now because, again, you don't want to have to reassemble this later on. Next, with the wheel sets in place roughly, we're going to now go ahead and grab the pickup shoes and mate them up with the actual side frames. These are the old school side frames. They have two different locking points, one in the middle and then one on the either end of the trucks themselves. And just to make sure everything's hunky-dory, I'm going to just lubricate the shoe pickup area right there. This, again, those little holes are where the axles will go through with just a hint of that stuff. I tend to do it over, I admittedly overdid it a little bit on this one. Next, we take the pickup shoe and place it into position on the truck as so. And then we'll take one of the side frame clips, the side frame covers slash clips, etc. And place it on top of the pickup shoe itself, holding it in place. And we'll apply gentle pressure until we hear it snap. Now again, this is not fully secured. The actual second, secondary security comes in when we mount the base plate. Again, we'll repeat the procedure for the other side. Again, a little conductive lube, just a little bit on the brush. Go over the splines for the gear, the, the uh, 
elongated axles and again we do the same thing with the shoes put a little lubricant in those and then we'll go ahead and slip that assembly right over the elongated axles and press the clip on top we'll repeat the same procedure on the other truck getting everything lubricated etc and getting it set up to be slipped underneath the chassis as well now we're ready to put the trucks back in position, at least loosely. We're going to place a little 107 lube right here on the connecting coupler, if you will. These have this very unusual circular connecting coupler that holds in two sort of pieces. It's a very secure system, doesn't have any wear or down points because of how it focuses the stress, stress across the circle, very unique. Anyway, once we've carefully lubricated that and guided the wires in position, we can simply place the truck down, the, the frame down on one of the trucks. We then repeat the procedure to get the other truck into position. Now with the trucks back in position, we can now get ready to install the worm gears. The worm gears to prepare them, we're going to put a little 107 lube right where the bearings are going to go. We're also then going to reinstall the thrust washer right on front of the, where the front bearing goes, right there on the exposed shaft. With all that in place, we take the shaft and slip it into the worm gear, rotating if necessary to get it to lock into position, as there's a specific shape that that has to meet. You'll know it's in position as it will line up with the worm gear housing area right there. Once that's in position, we simply take some standard hobby lube grease, which is what I prefer to use here, and we're going to now squeeze some into the gaps of the worm gear itself. Making sure to press it down into position. Now with all that set, we're going to now take a worm gear cover, as we see right there, and simply snap it right into position to hold the worm gear in position, which will also secure the truck at the same time, as per the design of this locomotive. And we'll again repeat the same procedure for the other truck to get its worm gear and worm gear shaft, etc., and back into position, as well as the worm gear cover. Next, with our worm gear covers successfully installed, it's time to install the kit itself. Now, there are a few different pieces. The first piece of this kit that comes from TCS is the, At is the AKMB1, which is a Keep Alive board. This will transform our old-style 8-pin equipped locomotive to a 21-pin style locomotive. It will also add Keep Alive, which will allow this locomotive to keep going even if it runs into bad sections of track or actually no power at all, as I've demonstrated in a few of my other videos. It's a very effective little tool to get around weak sections of track in your land, or if you have areas like in my layout where you just can't access the locomotive and you don't want it to stall. This is a great way of preventing that from actually happening to begin with. With the board now successfully installed, it's time to use our soldering iron and start to tin everything up and get it ready to be soldered together. Again, tinning means to add solder to the specific components. In this case, we have to tin all four of the power pickup pads, as well as the two motor pads, and as well as the two speaker pads. As you see right there, I'm just going to go ahead and, with my exhaust fan running, I'm going to go ahead now and just apply some solder to the tip and just gently heat up the pad with it and just let it come right into position. Kind of an awkward way of doing it, but I find this is the only way to really get this done correctly on this board. Another weird quirk of these TCS boards is that there is no hole to put the wire through, unlike most boards like the Loke Sound and the other such boards made by TCS, in fact. You run the wire through, there's actually a hole in the pad itself, you run the wire through, you then put the solder in, you then actually tin that area around the solder, you then actually tin the solder as you put the wire through, and what it does is it literally fills in the hole and basically locks the wire in place. Here you have to literally put the solder on top of the pad itself and then heat the and then tin the wire itself and heat the two of them up together to get them to bond. It's a little bit trickier but you get the hang of it eventually. So anyways you see here I'm gonna go ahead and tin all four of my connections there. We'll start with the power connection hookups. Please note again I have this board does not have a decoder on it. That's gonna get installed later once I finish soldering all of this together. Next we're gonna tin the actual wires. Again we need to have the solder pads meet with them. There is a hint of solder on there, but I like to always make sure that there's some fresh stuff as I find it works much better with fresh solder. You want to make sure, again, the wires bond very well. You don't want what's called a dry or a cold connection, which will mean less conductivity with the, with the system and in, in uh, inconsistent connections and or erratic connections, which can lead to really terrible locomotive performance, even with the Keep Alive system being used. Next, we repeat the procedure again on the opposite side of the locomotive, again getting the four initial connections is what we're worrying about right now. Again, same procedure, tin the wire, tin the pad, make sure they both bond correctly, make sure there's a good, solid, and silver connection, as you see they all are, which is what it should be. Again, TCS does not recommend, in fact, it strongly recommends against using flux, so you have been warned, warned, uh, yep, good idea not to use it according to what they say, so in this case I don't use that anymore. I've had mixed results with getting it to work without the flux, but as you can see in this case I didn't use any. I just went ahead and tinned everything and it seemed to go together correctly. Next I'm going to go ahead and tin the motor drive pickups, which are right in front of the actual 21-pin 
decoder board itself. Same usual procedure, again, heat the soldering iron up and tin the pad itself. And once we successfully secure all the wires, it's time to now actually secure the weights back into position. Pretty easy to go in. They just, because we haven't modified anything, we simply place them back in their stock locations and utilize the stock screws to screw them down. We also want to make sure that the wire travels along the conduit or corridor that's been set up along the side of the waste right there. If we don't do this, the wires can get trapped when you reassemble the shell, and that can cause them to get ripped out of place, which is something you don't want to have happen after you've put all the effort we have into soldering all those wires up. And now with the weight in place, we're now going to tin the two pads that in fact allow us to hook up the lights themselves. Same procedure, heat the soldering iron up and put some solder down on the pads. Once this is done, we can then go ahead and mount our headlight in place. With the headlight now all set up in place, it's not, we've now installed our decoder as we know it on the top of the green board and it is now sitting on top of the Keep Alive board. This is again a TCS uh, decoder. Design. We can also now take care of our speaker, which we are going to mount to the shell using double-sided foam tape. Very handy for this, it'll easily support it. We tin and connect the wires to the two speak output wires on the board just like we did before and using a piece of double sided foam tape we'll mount the speaker to the roof of the engine where the other weight has been removed giving it enough space to actually sit in place. And again as you notice this is how I did it there I put the speaker with the speaker drum head itself facing upward toward the baffle and the base facing down to get the best sound. Next we carefully guide the wires around and begin to test fit the shell. This is a bit on the treatiest side. You want to make sure you make sure all the wires are carefully tucked in. It is very easy to rip a wire if this is not done carefully. So my advice again, take your time, tape the wires down, make sure you get everything just right. And with that charming reassuring clip, we now know that the shell is in correctly. We can now go ahead and reinstall the couplers, just sort of the reverse procedure of getting them out. And with all that, we've basically finished reassembling this locomotive. Now the only thing left to do is to test her and see how she runs. Okay, you know, with that, the locomotive is done. <laughs> okay. I can't think of a better place to show the advantages of have keep, having Keep Alive than in my own yard, Midville Yard, right over here. What you see is, well, undergone quite a few of upgrades since I'd last seen it on any of these videos. Anyway, let's give this one a try and see how she handles. Note how smoothly the locomotive goes and slowly, or especially over the switches. This is again mainly due to the Keep Alive capacitors, which store up a little bit more energy inside the board itself, allowing the locomotive to make it over the rough spots and track without any hesitation whatsoever. With all the work I've been doing in Midville Yard, there are quite a few boxcars and other such cars that are kind of out of sorts and not where they're supposed to be. What better time to get them out of here? And two of the ones that I can't stand that are completely out of place are this boxcar and that front loader. So they're going to be making a trip up Whitestone Mountain.
I must say, I love the 251-30 exhaust note you get from the WOW sound decoders. Time to switch on to the mountain branch. Please note, all trains must stop at the red signal and request permission to enter Whitestone Yard. Unfortunately, our engineer was kind of slow on the brakes today. Permission granted, we proceed into the yard. We drop our cars and head back out, running like to Midville. Note, the simulated radio chatter you've been hearing is coming from number 1800, which is Soundtracks Equipped, which is parked at the service ink station in Midville Yard, where this locomotive will be parked.
And that's just going to about do it for this project. I hope everyone enjoyed the TCS sound install on this RS-11. I'm very glad to finally have this in service after all the trouble I went to finding a chassis for the shell. If you liked it, thumbs up. If you didn't, thumbs down. Please subscribe. And as always, keep your wheels on the track.